lies a lovely white beach to seek solitude and watch the sun disappear over the horizon. It's amazing to watch this particular painting take shape as we develop it with some very unusual techniques. I think you're going to find another interesting approach that you can use with oil paints to achieve some very interesting effects. I've done a little bit of uh, preparing in advance for the time allotment that I'm allowed. And all I've done is gone to my canvas, which I'm working on a 16 by 20 stretch canvas, but I've applied a very thin, even coat of my basic white. Now, my basic white is a very creamy bodied formula that will allow the paints to continue to move on the canvas very easily. So I used a large two and a half inch brush, uh, loaded up a little bit on my brush and covered the entire canvas so my paints will continue to move freely. Some of the techniques that I'll be using in this particular painting will allow the paints to move more easily. And a very creamy body paint that really, really will move, will uh, make this technique work in its uh, best way. To begin, I won't use the large two and a half inch brush. I want to establish the glow area for the sun back down close to the horizon as it seems to be going down across behind the ocean. I'm going to use a, a fan brush loaded with a little bit of my basic white and a little touch of yellow bring in the first little touch of glow in the sky. Let's go up to the canvas and we'll be working in a little off center to the right. Now you want to make sure you don't work dead center because we're going to locate and have a little dip to the land off to the right edge. So I'm just going to kind of sweep or brush this golden glow area in and I'm just kind of making kind of like a figure eight as I brush that in. And that's going to be the initial uh, burst of light just as it's going down over the horizon. Then we're going to go down to the palette and we're going to mix into that a little tiny touch of red. And I've already pre-mixed a little red and yellow together to get a nice orange. I don't suggest you paint along with me in 27 minutes on the t television series. I have to do a lot of pre-planning to allow the time to maybe share with you some of the techniques that make my paintings work so uh, simply or seem to work so simply. So uh, don't try to paint along. I suggest you take notes and then you'll find that you can use reference or tape the shows and then come back and do them at a, a much slower pace. Okay, back up at the canvas, we're going to sweep this orange color around that glow area. And as I ease my pressure, it just kind of melts together and still leaves that illuminated look or lighter area around the glow. I need to go down to the palette once more, pick up a little more of that orange tone. And I'm making this one kind of vibrant, so it'll really contrast on your television. You can make it a little more soft pastel effect. We need to repeat that coloring down in the water. And of course, when I'm thinking of a water area, I brush more horizontally than blending out. And I'm just allowing that glow in that general shape area. Maybe a little more over here on the left, where we need that silhouette against the uh, reeds and grasses from the beach. I think one more little touch, strengthening that mix of the orange. Of course, that's yellow with a touch of red. Worked into the brush thoroughly. And once again, I'm using a fan brush because I want to keep control of how much paint I put on the canvas. We'll get a nice little burst of orange. Sunsets are fun to work with because you can uh, work with such a variety of colors. I'm going to break this area up a little bit so I don't get a hard line developed. And a little more on the right. Looks a little bold right now, but when we get the blues and the softer colors in, you'll find that that coloring will enhance the painting. A little more spunk of color right there. And we want to get rid of the white on the edge here. So I've basically created a atmosphere or backdrop for my grasses and my beach to uh, contrast against. I'm going to work uh, the brush on a paper towel a minute and wipe out most of it and take just a little touch of burnt umber on the brush. Now you can clean your brush, but I find that right now I'm just indicating placement. I'm using a little bit of brown or burnt umber, and I'm going to locate my areas or my land masses that are going to be uh, meeting down beneath that sun glow area. So I've got a little bit of a dipping angle line here, and another one that comes in and meets it and comes and uh, goes off to the left, just above the bottom left-hand side of the corner. That's basically my layout of the sand dunes and the land. And I even let some of the glow area reflect on the sand in here. You can create and try this one on a horizontal co composition. It's very nice. Using the same fan brush, I'm going to add a little blue. That's Prussian blue with a touch of alizarin. It's going to give me kind of a shadowy gray blue. I don't want it to be too strong. I'm letting a little umber stay in there to keep it kind of grayed. And then I'm going to go up and I'm just going to shadow this a little bit just by 
rubbing a little color on and skimming gently. I'm not putting much paint on, I'm just allowing a little toning of the canvas at this stage. Kind of interplaying or intermixing colors. Doesn't look too attractive in this stage. That's what I like about teaching this one in classes. The students can see how a painting can develop and change as it progresses through different levels and different stages. Okay, now remember I have basic white on there, so that lets that brush mix in without much effort. I wanna switch brushes for a moment and go to the large two and a half inch brush that I had applied my basic white on, and I wanna work on the sky just a little bit. Let's go in and mix a little Prussian blue with just a touch of uh, alizarin in it to make it kind of a lavender mix. Staying away from the little bit of brown, I don't wanna get a dirty sky, but I do want that last evening light, the kind of shadowy sky coming in that will uh, help create this last illuminated effect. So we go up to the canvas, and I'm just gonna brush first, kind of holding the brush horizontal and just kind of short sweeping strokes, block out the white that was on the canvas. I let it bump into the orange just slightly. And I'm not gonna come down too far. It almost turns a little green in there, but a slight change of color can be attractive. Now I'm gonna develop that a little farther by going once again to a deeper value of the same mix using more pigment of Prussian and alizarin, making it a little more on the purple and less on the blue. So I get a different, more of a shadow cloud effect. Using the large two and a half inch brush will allow the paint as we develop it to keep a loose effect. So you can kind of tap little clouds on. And just by gently patting, you can get this wispy type of effect. If you stir too much, it gets a little too heavy. I like to bring a little heaviness down from the top and it leaves the little lighter areas show through. Sometimes I have my students do this with a fan brush and then they design their clouds with a fan brush technique. But your large two and a half inch brush helps uh, do this with speed in this particular painting and uh, for the time that I have, but I want you to realize that you can develop a painting with smaller brushes using a lot more time. Okay, I have just a loose effect in the sky. That I'm gonna soften in just a moment. But before I do and before I uh, worry about going with a clean brush, I like to get a little more color down in the sand area. That color that's in my clouds, repeated, I'm gonna darken down on the bottom edge of the canvas and gently kind of ease up into the existing one. And you'll notice if I just kind of wave my brush down over this, the paint seemed to move or blend and soften very nicely. That's because of the white base coat and that little bit of a wavy stroke, I can even go from one area to another, allows kind of a melting of colors and it softens the lines. This is toning the canvas and I can always put lights back on, but I can get little patterns of light that seem to be uh, shades of uh, shadows from the grass, even adding a little extra color to the brush and tapping it on to the canvas and just kind of pulling it away from your light source may be the grasses that are shadowing down on the sand. It can create interesting patterns. But we've got to do a lot more up into that. Let's just bring that just a little bit over on the side. Okay, once a, a, a moment ago, I mentioned that I would like to soften up in the sky area. I find that's kind of an important step because if I leave this clouds a little too busy, then it's gonna have a tendency to take away from the nice reflective uh, silhouetted grasses against that uh, sky. It takes away from the drama there. So let's take a clean, dry one inch brush, go up to the sky area for just a moment and lightly and gently tap and take a little of the harshness out, not destroying the effect. I'm not stirring hard. I'm just looking around for some little spots and there's a little cloud, just tap it on a paper towel and then I'll just brush that in and make a little soft, wispy type of effect. You get an intermixing there. Sometimes I'll take a fan brush and I'll bring a light source from the bottom and hit the bottom of the clouds and make them a little more distinct, but I don't want them to detract, once again, from the real focal point of the grasses. What we'll do now is we'll switch to a number 16 flat brush and uh, we will make a uh, little sun effect. To do that, I'm using a clean, dry brush and I'm gonna go into some titanium white from the palette and kind of loading the brush heavily. And I'm going to go in and I'm gonna use this brush more like a screwdriver, not brushing this way, but actually holding the brush with my hand that I don't paint with, deciding where I'm gonna have a horizon in there that I haven't established, but we, maybe we should put that in. But since I'm ready for this step, let's go up into the light glow area, 
put the brush to the canvas and literally just rotate and screw in the sun. And it gives a little light spot and the brush will actually form a nice circular area. And you can do that a couple of times until you build it up to the level that you feel is bright enough. While I have this brush in my hand, I'll go down to that orange because the white will mix with the orange and add just a touch of ochre to it. And we'll find that horizon that's off there in the distance. And we want to try to keep this fairly straight, but your water is not your important part of this composition. So let's come in and just below the sun area, just kind of skim the surface. Notice how easily the paints move. They're very soft paints. So that helps complement the approach that I'm working wet on wet. And of course the oil stay wet so you can play and develop this farther. So that creates kind of like a horizon. And I need to stand back to make sure I get that as level as I can working at this speed. Okay, to create drama on the water, you can use a palette knife. And there are a couple of different knives we can use. I think we'll work with the painting knife. Go to the palette and load up some titanium white. And just come right underneath the sun area and just touch that line and bring in a few little sparkle lines down just directly underneath it. Just kind of lightly touching the canvas. You could do this with the liner brush also, but I just want to have a little impact of glimmer on the, the water. Once again, the water's not the important part. What we're going to be doing in the next step as we develop the painting is that we're going to create a foundation of color for the grasses. Now I'm going through these steps fairly fast so I can get to the detail work because it's the detail work and the little grasses and the sea oats that uh, develop this painting and really give the painting its character. If you look at it in its rough stage right now, if we'll go up to the canvas and just look at the stage that it's in right now. Just some shadows of the blues on the sand and of course your bright glow in the sky. And of course we have some blue sky up above. If you back up just a little bit, I think you can see that full overflowing balance of your sky colors into your sand colors. It's, if we'll go to the finished painting just for a moment, I think then you can kind of visualize a little better or see how those grasses are going to contrast against that lighter area of the sky. In the finished painting, I have a little white in the clouds, but I'm not going to uh, worry about that at this stage because I want to get to the other uh, steps of the grasses. They are the most important. So these other uh, stages are a block in that I uh, can build on. What I have done to prepare my paints to work in a technique that we're going to do and push the grasses up. We're not going to paint them so much as we're going to just kind of lay paint on a canvas and push that paint up and allow it to visually grow and to literally grow. What I've done is gone to my palette, and if you come down to the palette, I have uh, a couple of mixes I'm going to be using. I've taken some yellow ochre, and I used a fan brush, and I dropped thinner into it until I soften that to a very creamy, creamy mixture. It performs like mustard, so you can kind of think of mustard or mayonnaise in its uh, consistency. Once I mixed that mix, I went over to a little Prussian blue with a little ochre still left on the knife. That's going to give it a greenish cast. So if you leave ochre, it's okay. Bring a little ochre, mix some Prussian blue, and add a little bit of burnt umber for real dark. It's kind of a greenish brown. It's not a pretty color, but it's a good, dark, rich, vibrant color. And it has a slight cast of green to it. I also added a little thinner to that. The best way to add your thinner is use a dry fan brush and just drop little drops occasionally into it until you feel the consistency of the paint. And I want to make sure I have enough of that mix so I don't run out. And I've just got a second mix or a medium tone. It looks almost black, maybe a touch of yellow in that. Give it a little bit more of a green cast. Although I want these grasses to be more dry than I want them to be uh, green. Then I'm going to go over to my burnt umber, which is my warm, warm brown, and I pre-mixed it just a little bit and softened it. So the consistency of the paints is what I'm concerning myself, so they will perform and move very easily on the canvas. Now, when I try to teach this to students in a classroom session, it scares them to death to actually apply the paints as I'm going to apply them right now. But you kind of have to get used to it and practice a little bit, and you can practice on newspaper before you go to a canvas. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to use a painting knife, and we're going to lift up first some of the yellow ochre, and then we're going to go up to the canvas, and we're literally just going to kind of lay on a little glob of paint. Now, it doesn't look like much, but this is exactly how I would want the students or would like you to try to do it. I'm going to load some more paint, and once again, I'm starting with the light color and tap a little bit 
over there. You don't want to form a hard line or look like just a little arch there. Let's just block in some color. Just lay that paint on, and I'm putting it on fairly heavily. Picking up a little more. Let's go, maybe a little patch right over in here. Just laying that on. Now this is gonna be fun because we now have to develop into the warmer tone or the burnt umber, which I'm using it just about straight, but it's thin down, and lay that in right underneath it. Sometimes I put the umber at this level and I'm making kind of a sandwich effect, the ochre, then the umber, and then I'm gonna use the black green kind of at the baseline. A Little more umber and just kind of tap it around. It intermixes slightly. Notice how I let it just kind of tap around and leave little marks and interesting things happening. Makes you wonder if this is really gonna work, doesn't it? I know it'll work because I've done it a number of times and it's a fun way to do it. <coughs> okay, now let's go in with our darkest value or the darkest mix. And that, of course, has that little bit of a greenish cast. Sometimes I use more blue. Pick up a little bit on the palette knife, come up to the canvas and put a little bit underneath there. Now I have some students who don't give themselves enough paint and other students who give themselves too much. So you have to practice at this. It's practice that helps you understand these techniques and get them to work for you. Gosh, does that look kind of funny at this stage. But can you notice really mostly the contrast, the values, the fact that I'm looking for interesting effects in the color of the paints. You can use this for all green grasses or a lot of different things. But once again, I'm just getting the paint on the canvas and that's what we're really at this stage trying to do. And here's the fun part that makes this work. It's almost kind of amazing. They call it magic, and I guess this is what you call the magic parts of it, is allowing that paint to grow. And we're not gonna brush it up. This is one thing I wanna stress. Do not take a brush, touch into it, and stroke. You want to hold the brush, and I've got two here. I have got a stiff bristle fan brush and a very soft, delicate little uh, fan brush, which will push the paint in two different ways. I'm gonna use this brush parallel to the surface, holding it very loosely so it's just kind of dangling in my fingers, and I'm gonna catch underneath the paint, and in the center of where I want a clump of grass, I'm going to lift and just push that paint and let it just graze and skim up, and the paints begin to intermix. And as I kind of skim the surface, I get the little weeds and grasses, and notice the interplay of color that happens. If I get too much paint on the brush, I can wipe it on a paper towel, and let a little interesting grass grow up over here. Just gently, no pressure. We can even let it kind of turn its little line. Now, doesn't that begin to look a little bit like grass is playing in there? Here's a little clump here. And once again, I'll develop these a little farther, very gently. If I get too much paint, I just gently wipe the brush. Now, that's a fun way to make grass. Grows very quickly, gives you an assortment of colors. If you want, you can switch to the softer brush and come in real close, and I'll show you how we taper down or we make smaller, finer grasses. This is clean and dry. I'm gonna just gently just lift and put little runners or feeder roots that kind of just tap down and hug the ground. And you can just lightly use the paint that's on the canvas in a lot of cases, or let it grow a little taller. Or because this is softer, you can get more delicate lines that just kind of seem to float up. And I'm letting a few hairs kind of graze that paint and grow. That's a lot of fun to do. Let's just soften that up a little bit and add down here in the bottom right hand corner a few more little runners. You could add paint to this brush if you find you need it. Up the hill, down the hill, there's just lots of ways you can design this. Let's put a little bit out here, a little small clump. All I'm doing is using the paint that I picked up here and there and kind of connecting to and creating those little roots hanging on to the paint. Okay, I think that's going to be enough, and I think you can see how underneath the sand begins to have a nice play of color, and you don't have to worry too much. Let's develop that. Now's where I really want to concern myself with the structure of the grasses. That's a foundation. It's kind of like a block in with color interest that I can build on. So as I take the liner brush, that I'm going to use just with a little thinner. This is what I find very interesting. Since our paints are soft, and they move very easily. They're not sticky paints. You have to remember that. Cream your paints or, or get a creamy bodied paint and then thin it with a little thinner. You don't really need oil. And you can use just thinner. Now this is turp on the brush and the paint will already move that's on the canvas. Start off when you go up to the canvas and use the paint that's on the canvas. 
take the liner with a little bit of thinner and just stretch that paint. Pull individual long, delicate blades up and create a clump of grass. Let's go over here to the right for a moment and create a clump of grass maybe that uh, is taller in the center. We're going to put some oats on this, maybe a few coming from off the side. Borrow paint. Go over here and bar a little of that dark and uh, pull in and maybe some grasses off the edge of the canvas or peeking in. And they're maybe in shadow. I'm going to come down here maybe into the front foreground and pull some tall, delicate little individual blades up. So I work with the paint that's on the canvas. Now remember the foundation that we had built earlier on the canvas, maybe a few that break the horizon over here. Just these look like they're in a little bit of a shadow. That was some of the darker color stood out there. Gives it a little distance. This is where you can spend lots of time developing the character of the grasses and give more perspective. You don't want to totally lose all your blues and your glow on your sand. All of this is meant to work and enhance the effect. So this little glow area that I allowed to happen in there was planned. I also, if I felt necessary, could go in and highlight the sand a little bit. Maybe take a little white and throw a little patch of sunlight on the sand. You could do that with a palette knife. You could do it with a brush. Many options are available with oil. You can just to try to learn to be a little free with your paints. As soon as you go in with a brush and worry about that first little line of a grass, you're going to get kind of uh, uptight, and then your, your painting's not going to flow easily. So it takes a little while to become comfortable with a medium, and once you learn its basic effects, then you have uh, a little more freedom to play. But I find it's that freedom that allows my paintings to look a little better. So I have a lot of fun, and I just jump right in and hope the, that the uh, water's fine, so to speak. Okay, I'm going to use a little touch of my white and then back down to a creamy white on my palette with just a tiny touch of ochre. I'm going to bring a little play of sunlight on the sand. Maybe that sunlight is skimming across the tops of the dunes. And let's come over here and maybe bring a little sunlight right in there. Now, if you come up close, I'm just going to set a little paint and I'm going to start kind of tapping it, giving it a little sparkle edge. If it picks up too much of the other paint, wipe the bottom, pick up a little more, and then come back up and just play a little ridge of light. And I'm just pressing, almost like I'm pressing it into the canvas and bringing a little sparkle on it. Notice it breaks up and it gives a little uh, textured interest. Then you can always bring your other grasses back up over it so it kind of tucks it in or even pull them down to the next level. That's variety that allows the painting to develop. Another thing that works quite interesting is to use the handle of a liner or the point of a palette knife and scratch in some light ones. Now the reason this works so effectively is when you take the handle and you come up to the canvas in an area where you have a lot of darks. Now there's a lot of dark paint here, but remember what was underneath that. Underneath that was that golden orange. If you use the handle or a sharp object, a stylus, and scratch in, you'll scratch down to the lighter color and it'll give you a couple of bright sunny grasses in front of the dark ones. So this is another way. Scratch ends are, are very commonly used in oil paints to give you more uh, control of the defined lines. So as I go over to the different areas, you can see how just the handle, can you hear that scratch in, will create some shorter grasses that contrast against the dark. The sharper the stylus or the point, the more effectively that's going to scratch down to the uh, dark, the lighter paint underneath. So I can change the depth of the, that clump of grass. Let's come down here and do a few of those scratch ends for balance. Now you can have your, all your grasses blowing in the breeze one way or the other way, or it's fairly still day, and you can have them just going in one direction. You don't need a lot of these, but once again, this is something that you can, you know, do a few stages of it, stop, work on something else, and then you can go ahead and you can uh, develop it uh, to as many or add as many as you want. I'm going to go in now with a little more thinner and a little more dark and I'm going to pull a few more of those tall, tall grasses up so I can put a few of the oats on them. These are the interesting, beautiful, graceful oats that seem to just blow in the breeze and we'll have a slight breeze today, nothing too bending and I need the stalks for these to uh, rest on. So let's go back up to the canvas over on the left and I want to unify the painting by pulling a few extra tall ones up so it seems to almost touch into the sky that's up there. And it has a tendency to connect the sky and it's no longer a separate part. It gives a nice silhouette interest and pushes the sky back by painting the object in front of it. 
Okay, maybe a little more paint on the palette, on the brush one more time, down to the palette, then back up, and let's make a couple of more dark ones. Just a few. Once again, I can let these sea oats or grasses grow very tall. The finishing touch is going to be the seagull and the sea oats. I'm going to start with that soft little mini fan, although my large one would work. Go to some yellow ochre, load it into the brush, a little touch of dark on the end and I'm going to use the benefit of this fan brush to come right up here and come in real close and touch and just do a little oat or just a little sweeping arch to make these little oats on it and I'm getting both the colors I'm going to try to squeeze in a few quick birds but I'm running out of time let me try to get those on while you're watching and hope you enjoy this one try these soft paints and how it's going to work and I hope you enjoy doing this one thanks again for joining me to get your Paint with Petard 2 step-by-step -step instructional guide by Lynn Petard, send $14.95, check or money order to Paint with Petard 2, P.O. Box 1713, Department G, Delray Beach, Florida, 33483, or call 1-800-942-4000. Please have your MasterCard, Visa, or American Express card handy. That's $14.95, check or money order to Paint with Petard 2, P.O. Box 1713, Department G, Delray Beach, Florida, 33483. Price includes postage and handling. This 72-page full-color guide contains the 13 paintings shown in this series. You can brush up on your technique weekdays, too, with the joy of painting, every Monday through Friday afternoon at 2.30, right here on Channel 2. Stay tuned now because there's good cooking next with Boston's own Julia Child, followed by a trip to British Columbia's magnificent Birchard Gardens, on the Victory Garden at 4.30. Paint with Petard 2 with Lynn Petard was made possible by a grant from Lang Nickel Artists Brushes and Graphics Plus of Florida Incorporated, publishers of educational and instructional materials. Local broadcast of Painting with Petard is made possible by our members in partnership with the Prescott House Nursing Home, located in North Andover, Massachusetts, and owned and operated by the Solomon family. And with the Magic Touch Art Studio in Maynard, Massachusetts, owned and operated by Chuck O'Neill. Tonight at 8, watch The World at War. One of the most important chronicles of conflict ever seen on television. Sir Lawrence Olivier, your host. Then at nine, John Le Carre's Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, where friends are enemies and truth and justice carry the ultimate price. And at 10, Hollywood Legends celebrates the lives of two beloved Hollywood stars, Steve McQueen and Natalie Wood. TV worth watching on a Saturday night, so stay tuned. Here at WGBH, our goal is to make every family a member of our family. But we're still one family short, and guess who's missing? That's right, you. Only you can help guarantee that WGBH will continue to bring your family the very best that television has to offer. So please join our family today. Rush your check to WGBH, Boston 02134, or call 492-1111. And thank you.